Hello all, uh, welcome to the CME presentation. I'm Galki Dantalahun and I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine and critical care at uh, St. Paul's Hospital. Uh, we are going to be discussing about basic and advanced life support. Uh, this is going to be a presentation of the 2020 update by uh, American Heart Association. Um, so the outline of the, pre the CME would be, I'll introduce you some pointers about the uh, SALS and bad lanes guidelines, and then we'll move on straight to the update, uh, which will include cardiac resuscitation, airway and breathing, and ROSC care, uh, care, and we'll summarize and uh, we'll have some questions afterwards. Basically, what SALS and BLS are is a set of clinical interventions for the urgent treatment of cardiac arrest, stroke, and other life-threatening and medical emergencies. Usually, the world knows them by the uh, CPR and um, breathing support uh, um, algorithms, but they also include other life-threatening medical emergencies, such as tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias, and also acute coronary syndrome and stroke. So basically, there's, uh, they're divided, they don't have uh, that much evidence, the recommendations are not that much evidence-based, uh, which means that because there's no randomized controlled trials on patients with cardiac arrest, uh, basically there are a lot of ethical issues when it comes to cardiac arrest patients and doing research on them. So basically it's anecdotal evidence collected from different AMS services. That's how the evidence is synthesized and the guidelines are updated. But the principle remains the same, uh, whether uh, which is uh, it centers on calling for help act and activating AMS. Uh, compressions always come first. Uh, rescue breaths should be given between compressions and high quality CPR as well as early defibrillation are pillars of resuscitation. So what is the difference between BLS and LS? So BLS or what we call uh, basic life support is can be provided by lay rescuers uh, who, who are not healthcare workers or healthcare workers who are not trained with ACLS. And it includes cardiac compressions, breathing support, and defibrillation using an automated device. Um, there is no IV access uh, that's going to be given during BLS, and there's no provision of medications. But ACLS, which is an advanced version of BLS, it includes uh, cardiac compression, breathing support, uh, manual or automated defibrillations, and other ad uh, advanced interventions. They can include uh, airway management, different surgical pr procedures such as needle or open thoracot thoracotomies, chest tubes, and et cetera. Uh, medications are also involved, and they should be provided by uh, trained healthcare workers. Uh, so, just to give you a bit of a historical preview about um, ACLS, uh, the first mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation was given in 1740 in Paris, and then, you know, about 150 years later, Dr. Frederick Mass started the first chest compressions on humans, and American Heart Association in 1963 formally endorsed CPR as a way of resuscitating patients. Um, the guidelines started coming frequently since 1974, and they've been coming every five years since uh, 2000, the year 2000. Uh, there was a focused update in 2019, and another guideline was given to specifically address issues with uh, COVID patients in 2020. It involves different institutions, such as the American Heart Association and the International Liaison Committee on uh, Resuscitation, which also includes the European uh, Cardiac Association. So the guidelines basically come in, in, in a form of algorithms, which are set in a yes or no format. They have a, a total of seven, seven um, guidelines, but we're going to be talking about the cardiac arrest algorithm, including the PEAS systole and VFib and pulseless VTAC uh, algorithms in this specific presentation. There have been major changes throughout the years. Uh, just to give you a highlight of what's been happening, in 1995, they introduced defibrillators and they made the resuscitation to A, B, C, D, which means airway management, breathing, rescue, circulation with compression, and defibrillation. Uh, in 2000, they introduced a concept called stacked electrical shocks, which means that if you have a shockable rhythm, you can give three consecutive uh, defibrillations at, until uh, they convert. Um, in 2005, they changed the approach from ABCD to CABCD, which meant that you give compressions first or cardiac resuscitation and then move on to airway, breathing, uh, IV access support to the circulation system and defibrillation with a D. In 2010, the algorithm started to look like what we recognized as uh, 
uh, how we, we recognize them today by having um, focusing on BLS because what they discovered throughout uh, with the, with their data was that uh, compressions and defibrillation was a pillar of resuscitation. So they made BLS as a core concept of SELS and they emphasized on high quality CPR which we'll be discussing later. And they also introduced capnography which meant that if you they will insert capnography at the end of either an ET tube or an AMBU bag and measure uh, measure them to follow the effectiveness of CPR. So what the evidence says that if to say that then a, a compression is effective it has to be the ATCO2 has to be greater than 10 millimeter mercury. If it is above 20 then survival is better and if it is above 40 that means that uh, return of spontaneous circulation has happened. And they also uh, introduced a concept called a chain of survival, which meant uh, the first step would be immediate recognition of cardiac arrest and activation of the emergency response system. The second is early C CPR with compressions and rapid defibrillation, and also effective advanced life support, which can be given either in the ambulance if it is an outside of the hospital arrest, or if it is inside the hospital, then will have to move the patient to the ICU. And the fifth one is integrated post-cardiac arrest care within the ICUs. They also abandoned the look, listen, and feel approach, which meant that uh, you don't have to pause for an unresponsive patient to look if they're breathing, uh, listen if they're breathing, and also feel for a pulse because it delays in the start of compressions. So what they directly said is if you have an unconscious patient, check for the pulse and immediately move to uh, 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 providing CPR. And they also reemphasized the importance of compressions and high quality CPR. In 2015, the SALS moved into the modern day world, which meant that uh, you can use social media to activate EMS. I know we don't have an EMS, a proper uh, EMS system here. It is not that well integrated to our system, but in countries that have integrated and well-coordinated EMS system, uh, uh, social media such as Facebook or WhatsApp can be used to activate EMS. They also created community lay, uh, rescue or AED programs where people who work in uh, public places are trained to provide CPR and how to use AED. So if, if you have a heart attack and collapse in the middle of a concert, for example, uh, they can provide CPR for you. Uh, in 2019 focused updates, the most significant change was about airways. So do we intubate patients or do we not intubate patients? And we'll discuss this later. So what does the 2020 update say? The first thing that they changed was they added a sixth component to the chain of survival, which means uh, we've discussed this before, it means early recognition and prevention of um, uh, sudden cardiac arrests in, in hospital settings, but if it is outside the hospital, activation of uh, recognizing cardiac arrest and activation of emergency response system. And then high quality CPR followed by defibrillation and post cardiac arrest care. This has been the end of the uh, um, chain of survival until 2020. Now they added the recovery part where they are talking about set of algorithms and coordinated uh, protocols to take care of patients after they survive uh, their ICU stay after, post -card uh, after their cardiac arrest occurs. So why do we focus on early CPR and defibrillation? The evidence is the following. So the first part is if there's no CPR done for the patient or if it is delayed within a time of 10, uh, at least 10 minutes, then only up to 2% survive. If you see the X axis here, it is, it is, uh, it's talking about the time. So the second, the second evidence is if it is early CPR is done, for example, within a five minute period, but defibrillation is delayed, up to only 8% uh, survive. But if early CPR and early defibrillation is done, then up to 20% survive. This is if it is done within five minute period. If you combine early CPR, early defibrillation and SELS medication and other interventions, then up to 30% of cardiac arrest patients can survive. This is the evidence. This is why we focus on giving early CPR, early defibrillation and early SELS. I know in our country, we merely do CPR just for the sake of doing CPR and we don't usually expect our patients to survive, but if it is done correctly, up to 30% of our patients can survive the arrest. So the first concept, how do we recognize patients who are, um, who are in cardiac arrest? So in out of the hospital arrests, 
if you see an, an, an uh, unconscious patient, the first thing to do would be not to shake them, not to look if they're breathing or if they're talking, but just to feel their pulse on their carotid, and if there's no response, start the CPR immediately. Now the question is, like, what if the p patient uh, has a pulse, but the rescuer did not feel uh, the pulse during the checkup? So that's fine. Usually if the carotid pulse is strong, you can feel them directly, but if the rescuer uh, provide CPR whilst the patient has uh, a pulse uh, uh, by mistake, then little or no harm is done. That's what the evidence says. So if you don't feel any pulse, start CPR immediately and activate the AMS service. If it is within the hospital, in unmonitored beds, such as ward beds or in OPD situations, follow similar steps. If, if they are unresponsive, check for pulse, start CPR, call emergency services. But if it is a monitored bed, recognition usually follows because of uh, monitor alarms. It's triggered by monitor alarms. So immediately resuscitation can be started immediately because it's easy to recognize arrest, arrest rhythms on the monitor. What about compression? Now we've been talking about high quality CPR until now. So what does it mean? It, it means five major things. So the first is the rate should be between 100 and 120 per minute. If it is a little bit faster, more than 120 minutes, uh, compressions per minute, then it would mean that uh, circulation won't be achieved because of ineffective, uh, ineffective um, compressions. And because there's no cardiac uh, chest recall, there will be no cardiac filling and cardiac output would be compromised. Or what we would call an empty pump in a tachyarrhythmic patient. If it is less than 100, then we're not going to be having uh, uh, cardiac, or the cardiac output is not going to be enough to achieve ROSC. Uh, the second one is compression to rescue breath. It has to be 30 to 2 in an adult patient, and in a pediatric patient, it will have to be 15 to 2. Uh, the third concept is to allow complete recoil between compressions now, because we're trying to do it fast and hard, sometimes we forget that the chest has to completely rebound to normal state in between compressions, but that needs to be done. The fourth is minimal interruption between compressions, and we'll discuss about that topic a little bit later. And the other is rotating provider every two minutes to avoid fatigue. The other question is where do we compress? Now, uh, usually people do it uh, above uh, just uh, just below the clavicle, sometimes people do it on, entirely on the left chest, but the right place would be to have an imaginary line between the nipples and then doing it just below at the center. Now, effective compression, if it is done in that position, would can pump 30% of the normal cardiac output, which can preserve brain function in arrest patients. And CPR can be followed using arterial BP and uh, in tidal uh, carbon dioxide monitoring, if you have it. Now, talking about uh, minimal interruptions between compressions. Now, this graph shows, the first graph, uh, the first graph shows uh, when, we, when compressions are done, but with frequent interruptions and prolonged time. Now, what happens during compressions is that when you immediately start compressions, the cardiac output is not going to be much. But when you continuously uh, uh, provide compressions, the cardiac output would slowly start to build up and uh, up to 100% systolic blood pressure can be achieved if you're doing it good. But once you achieve that, imagine you're doing 30 compressions and then you stop for like 15 seconds, you're going to lose that cardiac output, which it took you around two minutes to build up. So you're going to start all over again. And that would mean that uh, ROSC is not going to be achieved as easily as it could have been. But if, minim if co co compressions are done continuously and interruptions are minimal, then you can sustain that 100 uh, millimeter mercury of systolic blood pressure, or at least 30% of the cardiac output that we expect to give for the patient. And that is better for the outcome. The other concept is defibrillation. Now, defibrillation, we've been saying early CPR, early defibrillation, but what do we defibrillate? There are four arrest rhythms that we know. It is pulseless electrical activity, which looks like a normal rhythm, but there's no pulse. And there's a systole, or what we commonly call flatline patients, which there is no electrical activity on the heart. And the other two is ventricular fibrillation, which is the picture that I have above. And the other is pulseless ventricular tachycardia, where uh, the pulse of the patient, the uh, there is wide complex ventricular rhythm seen on the, on the monitor, but there is no pulse. These two, the ventricular fibrillation and the pulseless VTAC, we do defibrillate. Uh, 
Sometimes that we're going to have fine ventricular fibrillations, which might look like this. We're also ex uh, expected to defibrillate such patients if we recognize it. Now, how do we defibrillate patients? For for the first thing would be the equipment. Now, biphasic defibrillators are preferred. Why do we prefer them? It's because of the bi uh, the the bidirectional movement uh, of electric energy that can be transmitted between the paddles. Now, because of this, the studies have shown that anecdotal uh, uh, evidences have shown that um, ROS can be achieved better with biphasic defibrillators as opposed to the monophasic defibrillators that are common in Ethiopia. So if you have biphasic defibrillator, make sure to read uh, the recommendation of the, of the company that made the defibrillator. So usually they would have, they would say like if you're defibrillating a patient, use such joules, which is usually 120 to 100 joules. But if you don't have the recommendation manual with you, just use the maximal uh, joule that, is, uh, that can be dialed uh, with the monitor, which is usually 200 joules. Uh, if you have monophasic defibrillators, then use the maximum 360 joule uh, energy. Uh, to, if you want to decrease uh, delays into defibrillation, uh, which is like we said, if you're taking for a pulse and you want to defibrillate quickly, then you can charge uh, your, um, um, your machine before you even check for the pulse. So that means that you will charge your paddles, be ready for defibrillation, and then check the pulse. And if it is a shockable rhythm, then you shock them immediately. But if you can't do that, and if you think that is a risk, then you can, you can recognize the rhythm, then make sure that compressions are continued, wait to uh, charge your paddles, and then when charging is complete, uh, stop compression, and then immediately uh, shock your patient. Um, and then afterwards, previously, we used to recommend people to wait and look at the monitor of the defibrillator to see the rhythm of the patient. But you don't have to do that anymore. So immediately after shocking the patient, continue CPR. Why do we do that? That is because evidence to show that in, even if ROSC is achieved and there is... Um, there is, you know, if the, if the rhythm con converts to sinus rhythm, um, it does not mean that there's going to be a perfusing uh, cardiac output immediately afterwards. And the second reason is that uh, it, there is no harm in providing CPR even if the ROSC is achieved. So you'll have to continue with the full cycle of compressions and then check for pulse and uh, rhythm afterwards. The other concept is opening up airways. Now, how do we open it? Uh, we know uh, three maneuvers, which are head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. But in cases of trauma, uh, which we seem to have a lot these days, uh, only jaw thrust should be used because we might uh, destabilize cervical injuries that have not been recognized before. Uh, the, other, the second concept is which, what kind of airway do we use for bagging? And, uh, and that would be oropharyngeal airway is preferred. Um, that is because if you have trauma patients especially, nasopharyngeal airways might end up in the brain of the patient because of trauma. So oropharyngeal airway is preferred. This is the picture of the oropharyngeal uh, airways for those who don't know. The other is previously people used to use uh, uh, coicoid pressure just to open airways. So nowadays, coicoid pressure is not routinely recommended because studies show that with a good intention of trying to open up airways by providing coicoid pressure, people have actually been blocking airways instead. So coicoid pressure is not routinely recommended to open up airways. This picture generally shows how to open airways, how to use oropharyngeal airways. So the first step would be to do jaw thrust and then insert uh, the airway with the curvature down on the opposite side. And then once you reach that place, slowly rotate the oral airway within the mouth of the patient. And then it would smoothly follow the anatomical position of the patient's oral, oral airway. Um, the other is, especially in cases of trauma, remember to use ample suctioning. Now, this is an example of a younger uh, suction tip, which can, which is able, like, instead of using a smooth, flexible uh, suction tip, which can, you know, uh, which can be twisted, uh, even kinked, and not su suction uh, large, um, large large secretions or thick secretions, this younger uh, um, suction tip is actually very, uh, very much more effective because it is rigid and it has wide diameter, which means that if you have large stains to suction out, it can easier, uh, easily suction it out. 
the other thing which we should remember, especially in trauma, is not to forget about foreign body removal. So usually in the emergency, if you're doing your resuscitation in the emergency, have appropriate equipment in the ER. If you are a lay person, even if you're a healthcare worker and if you don't have appropriate material in your uh, uh, department, then use the uh, foreign body removal techniques. But during that time, do not forget to provide uh, uh, chest compressions at the same time because compressions come first. Uh, the other is if you have a trained person and you're not able to remove the foreign body from the upper airway of the patient, then cricothyroidotomy might be indicated and bagging can be done through the crick. Um, in trauma patients, uh, if C. coli is impeding resuscitation, which is something that we usually use in trauma patients to make sure that the C spine is not destabilized, then remove it because you know the patient needs to be alive before we start worrying about uh, cervical uh, cervical spine injuries. Now, this is an example of a picture of a patient. If you can, as you can see, there are ample, ample, ample secretions, bloody secretions that the patient has, and not just that, but the, his teeth is lost, the frontal teeth is lost. So it is possible that this patient has some foreign body within his upper airway, especially his teeth. So while you're doing chest compressions, you can open the airway and just suction out the, 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 uh, the, the blood. And when you try bagging and if it becomes difficult, then you make sure that the compression is continued and then use your medullis forceps and other uh, removal materials to remove a foreign body from his uh, airway. Um, the other is regarding uh, intubation and advanced airways. So a systematic review that included uh, three large randomized controlled trials found there's no difference of outcomes between airway strategies using either bag mask uh, ventilation, so black grotic airway, or even tracheal intubation. So what does this mean? This means that we're not supposed to focus on intubating the patient uh, while doing CPR, because what does that result in? If the first thing is that it would uh, cause delay because you'll be stopping compression just to intubate the patient. And the second problem would be if the, if the rescuer is not a trained and you know, expert in intubation, then a failed airway would actually complicate the patient. So if, you, if, if you're thinking about advanced airway, it should be done only and only if, with an experienced provider, which can guarantee at least a 95% success rate of intubation within the first trial. And if the intubation fails, then, it, then um, other supragrotic airways should be inserted and uh, that should be inserted immediately. Um, if, if the intubation is successful, then what we're going to do is instead of following the 30 compression to two breaths, uh, uh, protocol, then we're going to continuously uh, comp provide compressions for two minutes and bag the patients every six seconds. So it's going to be continuous compressions and uh, uh, bagging uh, or breathing support provided for the patient. Now, there is no proven evidence that the mortality be, there is mortality benefit uh, overall. And that is because if we're doing continuous compressions and continuous bagging, then the the continuous compressions will make sure that the thoracic uh, uh, cavity is not op uh, is not inflated as it should as we would think would it would be. That means that we can be continuously bag the patient, but because continuous compressions are done, the thoracic cavity is not inflated and appropriate amount of tidal volume is not delivered to the patient. That's why uh, it is not as important to intubate the patient as it is important to uh, just. Uh, do uh, the normal uh, bag valve uh, mask ventilation. Uh, the other is the BVM, which I've been talking about uh, in, uh, with the airway as well. Uh, when you're giving the bag, when you're doing the bagging or providing uh, oxygenation and ventilation, then you should do it with, um, and it should last at least for one second. Uh, usually what we're doing is that once the compression stops, we just do one, two, and then continue with the compressions. That means that there's no time, there's no appropriate tidal volume delivered to the patient, which should be at least 500 to 600 milliliters, and it's not going to be as effective as we think, as we think it would be. So we can just calmly provide the ventilation to, uh, over one second. The other important thing is to uh, choose the appropriate, um, uh, the appropriate ambu bag to the appropriate patient. If you have a pediatric patient, then use the pediatric ambu bag. And if you have an adult patient, according to their height and their kilo, uh, do, uh, 
bag with the appropriate uh, uh, bag mask, uh, bag valve mask device. Uh, why do we do that? That's because if we're doing excessive ventilations, then it would result in gastric distension, regurgitation, and aspiration. Uh, and that would be a complication for the patient. And the second thing is, when we're doing excessive ventilations, that would mean that there would be increased thoracic pressure, which would in turn have decreased uh, uh, volume, uh, venous return. And that would mean that instead of providing the appropriate amount of cardiac output, which is maximum at least 30% of the normal cardiac output, we're going to have inadequate uh, cardiac output because of the over distension of the thoracic cavity. And that would be decreased survival uh, to the patient. So finally, the algorithm. What is the 2020 algorithm? So once you recognize that the patient has cardiac arrest, immediately start CPR and call your team. If you're two people, then one should be providing the CPR and the other should be activating the emergency response system, either in hospital or if it is outside the hospital, call the ambulance. If it is just one person, shout for help and then immediately start, for, uh, immediately start CPR. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, should be happening in uh, uh, simultaneously as the compression is the provision of oxygen. Usually what will be done would be uh, you bring an ambo bag and position it correctly uh, on the patient's face. Uh, and the other thing would, to do, uh, would be attaching monitor paddles. If you have the attachable pads, then attach it appropriately over the patient's chest. Usually what we should do is uh, the first monitor, the first pad would be attached just be, uh, below the uh, right uh, clavicle and the other one would be just above the apex on the, uh, on the left side, usually around the fifth intercostal space. Now you have two pathways. Uh, this is going to be during the first uh, pulse check, which happens after uh, five cycles of 30 by two compressions are done, which makes a whole one cycle of, uh, or one cycle of resuscitation. Uh, you will do pulse check over the uh, carotid artery, and you'll also check with either the uh, attached pads or, or manually with the manual defibrillator pads. So the first pathway would be the shockable rhythm pathway. If you have a shockable rhythm, then immediately you shock the patient and then immediately continue with the CPR for at least two minutes, or what I've said, as I've said before, the 30 by two compression cycles for five times. And during that time, you should be able to uh, have an, either an IV or an IO access. An IV access is usually preferred because it would mean direct uh, provision of fluids and medication directly to the vascular system, but if not, IO or intra osseous access can be uh, secured as well. So if you have a shockable rhythm again, you would shock the patient and then continue with your CPR just the same way as you did before. But this time you should be able to provide epinephrine. So the dose of epinephrine is one milligram every three, three to five minutes. Or if you don't have a timer person, that would mean do, giving epinephrine in every other cycle. Uh, and the other is, if you have a very experienced person next to you, you can consider advanced airway. But if you don't have any um, experienced person, you can continue with uh, bag valve mask ventilation. And the other is, if you have it, and this would be better, uh, have capnography attached. So if the patient is intubated, then you can attach the capnography directly at the end of the uh, ET tube, or if you're bagging the patient just with the mask, then you can attach it at the tip of the mask of the BVM. Uh, now, if you have a uh, shockable rhythm for the third time, now would be a good time to consider, you shock the patient, continue CPR, and now would be a good time to consider giving either amiodarone or lidocaine. Lidocaine, if you remember, ha have been, uh, has been kicked out of the SALS algorithm around in, I think, uh, 2015, but they have brought it back again now. So the loading uh, dose for amiodarone would be 300 milligram bolus, and the second dose would be given as 150 milligram uh, bolus. Uh, if you're using lidocaine, you can give one to 1.5 milligram per kg. So the kg should be estimated using ideal body uh, weight estimation of the patient, which can be calculated from the height of the patient. And the second dose would be half of that, either 0.5 to 0.75 milligram per kg uh, for the patient and you would continue with your uh, compressions as well.
But if you don't, ha you know, if you don't have any shock of a rhythm, I, uh, if the if the rhythm sh that's shown on the monitor is either pulseless electrical activity, or if the patient has flatline, or if it is uh, asystole, then continue with CPR, give epinephrine three to five minutes, or during every other cycle, and then consider advanced airway, and then uh, go through your reversible causes, which are the five H's and the five T's. Now, the five H's and the five T's are the only other uh, advanced therapy that you can provide for patients with non-shockable rhythms. So if you have hypovolemia, you can give the patient either with, you can provide the patient either with um, NS or RL resuscitation, uh, crystalloid administration that is, or you, if it is a trauma patient, then you can transfuse your patient. If it is hypoxia, then this time your advanced airway would be very handy. Uh, if you have a hydrogen ion or if that causes acidosis, then you can give, uh, good, um, you can give um, bicarbs at this point. Uh, if the patient is either hypokalemic, you can provide uh, potassium, or if it is hyperkalemic, then you can provide calcium gluconate and try to stabilize the cardiac muscles. If your patient is hypothermic, then you can actively warm your patient, either using warm silent through the veins or um, inserting NG tube and then uh, flushing the patient's GI system with warm saline. The other, the five T's are the tension pneumothorax, which can be deflated using a needle uh, thoracotomy. Usually test tubes may not be required because the needle thoracotomy would effectively deflate the patient and, uh, uh, and the patient can have effective circulations after that. Uh, if it is cardiac tamponade, then if you have a very experienced provider, uh, uh, pericardiosynthesis can be quickly done during the pulse shake. If you have toxins, then you should figure out, a, depending on the toxin that you have, you can provide medication, especially uh, currently during in Western settings, they have an opioid crisis have, uh, in their hands, so they use naloxone at this point. Um, if you, you, can, you can have two of the thrombosis, either pulmonary or coronary. If you have pulmonary thrombosis, then TPA should be uh, provided at this point. If you have coronary thrombosis, then uh, after ROSC is achieved, then you can take your patients to the PCA center. And these are the only interventions that you can do to uh, uh, patients with non shockable rhythms. Uh, the final pathway is either there will be no signs of or return of uh, spontaneous circulation uh, and you'll have to repeat your cycles over and over again. But usually after 20 minutes of resuscitation, you start considering uh, whether you should stop or not. So um, the only within 20 minutes, the chance of the patient surviving with permanent damage to the brain is very high. After 30 minutes, the, the, the chance of the patient surviving at all is very low. And in the situations, in Western settings, what they do is they provide ECMO or extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation for only selected patients. Uh, but this is something that we're not even going to consider in this country. Uh, but so generally, if you have to stop at this point, you'll have to stop. Uh, the only exception uh, to continue resuscitation in such patients for like even more than an hour would be for patients with hypothermia. So there's a term which is said, if you're not warm and dead, then you're not dead at all. So what, unless you, uh, if the, um, the hypothermic patient has returned, uh, has a core temperature of normal range, then CPR should be continued. And the only rational to do this is because when patients are um, in hypothermic conditions, it's usually assumed that their organs are, are protected from having permanent damage uh, from uh, hypoperfusion. And if you have achieved return of spontaneous circulation, or what we uh, shortly call the ROSC, then you'd immediately go to post-cardiac arrest care, which we'll be discussing shortly. Um, so, uh, ROSC, uh, what do we do? The first thing is recognizing ROSC, right? So, Naturally, clinically, we can determine it by feeling pulse uh, over the, paro the, uh, the carotid arteries, and by if you have an arterial line, then arterial BP measurement. Um, and uh, spontaneous arterial pressure waves can be detec detected if you have arterial, uh, arterial line in. But if you're following the patient using entitled carbon dioxide, then there will be an abrupt increase in CO2, which is usually above 40 millimeter mercury. So after you recognize return of spontaneous circulation, 
then you'll go through the primary and secondary surveys as any other resuscitations. So the first would be airway and breathing. If you have intubated the patient, then great. You will immediately uh, uh, um, connect the patient to a mechanical ventilator and start, start treatment, uh, start ventilation and oxygenation. But if you haven't, now would be a good time to intubate your patient and then uh, again, put them on a mechanical ventilator. Circulatory support, uh, usually we use pressors. Um, but if usually what happens is if the uh, duration of the arrest is very short, usually within five, if the patient is resuscitated with, uh, within five minutes, sometimes the patients can have good radial pulses immediately after ROSC is achieved. But as a rule of thumb, what we should be done is use pressors to uh, maintain um, normal uh, mean arterial pressure. If it is indicated, transfuse your patient. And if you have an acute coronary, uh, coronary syndrome patient in your hands, then cath lab is indicated. Um, advanced care sh should always, always be done in the intensive care unit. And the other thing that we usually forget is we should use neurological prognostication tools at this point after ROSC is achieved. Uh, the new thing within the 2020 guideline is a monitoring and treatment uh, guideline. They have never written a monitoring and uh, treatment guideline before, but they have established one right now. It includes the uh, neurological prognostication tool I've mentioned before, and the other is to follow the patients, not just uh, by medical and surgical treatment, but also to by following patients for anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and fatigue, which usually happens after surviving a cardiac arrest. And rehabilitation should not be forgotten because uh, some of the patients will have uh, some sort of neurological and motor function disability afterwards. Speech might be impeded, so rehabilitation should, be, uh, should not be forgotten. So what is recommended is usually, especially in uh, advanced settings, such as our specialized comprehensive hospitals and our comprehensive hospitals, there should be a written guideline on how to take care of patients after ROSC is achieved, including rehabilitation. Um, the final uh, concept would be about taking care of uh, pregnant women. So the algorithm is going to be the same. The only difference is, is going to be three or four points. So the first is prioritizing securing airway and breathing interventions because pregnant mothers are depend, don't have that much of lung reserve to, make, to sustain them uh, during cardiac arrest. So securing airway and breathing interventions are very much pillars of resuscitation. It does not mean that you should start with securing airway and breathing intervention, but start with your compressions, but emphasize on making sure that the, the lady has appropriate airway and breathing. The second point is where do we compress? press so uh, so we might go a little above the inter, uh, the uh, the the normal position of providing compressions, which means that we can do it on the internipple line or just a little bit above, because the gravid uh, uterus can push the diaphragm above and the heart will be pushed uh, above, uh, above the normal position as well. The other is we should not be focusing on fetal monitoring because it would shift the focus away from the mother. So don't, focus, don't even try to monitor the fetus at this point. So if we, uh, we should also not forget to plan for perimortem CS if it is a viable baby after, uh, after four minutes of, within four minutes of, uh, into the arrest. So somebody should time the resuscitation time and if it is four minutes, then somebody should do the perimortem CS immediately. And what we should never forget during this time is continue CPR during the procedure. Uh, what is said is immediately after the baby is removed, the mother might even have a chance of survival, which is why we're not stopping the CPR. And after ROSC is achieved, monitor the fetus. If, if, you manage to, uh, if the lady manages to survive the arrest, then monitor the fetus for bradycardia because uh, during temperature targeted therapy, which uh, the target is between 32 and 36 degrees centigrade, then uh, the baby might have is, or at, is at high risk of having uh, intrauterine bradycardia. Uh, so generally, as um, um, a summary, what, what is SELS? It is a set of clinical interventions for the treatment of cardiac arrest, stroke, and other life-threatening uh, medical emergencies. It is released every five years. Uh, and the core concepts, as we've discussed, is short arrest time, keep brain perfused, timely reassessment, smooth transition f from BLS or SELS into ROS care, and treatment of the underlying cause of the arrest.
The other is high quality chest compression with minimal interruption, early defibrillation and treatment of reversible causes remain the priority. This infographic is taken from the European guidelines, which they suggest uh, we should aim for five seconds or less in between uh, chest compressions. The Americans say we can wait up to 10 seconds, so we can just take the, uh, the range of five to 10 seconds interruptions in between uh, uh, compressions. Uh, what we should do during compressions, use basic airways, but if we're using advanced airway or for planning and go on um, inserting advanced airway, then a very highly skilled person which can uh, uh, guarantee 95% uh, success should do the intubation. And maximum of, of only two attempts is allowed during resuscitation. The other is use of adrenaline. Uh, use adrenaline as early as possible. Uh, so within uh, high dose adrenaline has been kicked out of the recommendations, I think in 2010. Uh, so what we should do is give adrenaline one milligram, either IV or IO, as early as possible. And it should be repeated within three to five minutes or every other cycle or every other pulse take of the patient, we should pro be providing uh, 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 epinephrine. The other is for those who have, when patients don't survive uh, from, from the uh, resuscitation, then we can do extracorporeal resuscitation, which is something that we don't do in this country.